but okay great all right welcome back everyone my name is candace she her pronouns and i am the program manager for solidarity works it is good to see everyone after a break from our library of things collab i am stepping in for tom he's had some computer issues but it looked like he is joining so welcome back tom i hope everything is going well there he is so i'll just finish out is that okay or you want to jump in no go go for it all right so tonight we're coming to you with fix it repairs um our presenters tonight are cami bruner jessa ways and tatiana and so up first we're gonna come with cami bruner so cami if you want to go ahead and share your screen we will go ahead and get started Make sure I'm not muted still. Okay, is it holding on, holding on? Okay, uh, hi everybody. Uh, for those who don't already know, I'm Cami. I oversee Repair Reuse Washington and forgive any lags of my internet because it's not always very consistent. Um, yeah, come back here, there we go. Um, Repair Reuse Washington is me. I just want to clarify, there's not like a whole organization, but I I work to convene a broad array of community repair groups, tool libraries, remakeries, and sort of a, an ecosystem around, around that uh, to elevate repair and reuse. I focus on Washington State and do a lot of intensive support there, but kind of like the the tool library alliance that has been in the works um, and working with groups across the US and Canada to some degree to to elevate all of our work and try to reduce the burden and the siloing that so often happens. And what I want to share with you all today is sort of the broad spectrum of how I've seen repair events and repair groups doing their their things across this network. And the for everything that I say, there will be at least six exceptions to that rule that's not a rule, but the main takeaway is that every repair, repair group does it differently. And I think that's great. So firstly, this, uh, what I have been calling the philosophical continuum. On sort of one end, you get your classical repair cafe that is inspired by uh, the International Repair Cafe started by Martin Postma in the Netherlands. And its, its impetus was more community building and environmental motivations. So it's, it's very much like fix, fix for neighbors. So inviting people to sit down, um, spend time, get to know their fixer, just chat, uh, and keep some things in, out of the landfill in the process, hopefully. Um, it's very, it's very sweet. A lot of the groups um, really focus on like having coffee and, and snacks for folks um, so that it is more of this just sort of like a cafe vibe. At the other end of the spectrum is some of you may be familiar with Peter Mui's Fix It Clinics, and he takes a, a much different approach where you come through those doors with your broken item and you're going to be handed tools and expected to be part of part of your own repair process. There are coaches available and they will provide some guidance, but ultimately the the goal is not necessarily to fix the item, but to overcome fears about approaching whatever the, the issue is and to like get in there, dig in and feel empowered, um, becoming more familiar with tools, becoming confident to like, maybe you're gonna break it more and that's okay. Um, repair is definitely a byproduct in, in this scenario. I would, in a way, I would say, it's kind of a byproduct in all of the scenarios. On one hand, you have more like community is the goal and the other empowerment is the goal. And then in the middle, it's just sort of a mixture of both. Uh, I've seen a lot of groups 
where they will invite, there's their set of fixers and they invite guests to come sit with them. And to the degree that the guest feels comfortable, they can assist with the repair or like work on part of the repair while the fixer is working on a different thing. So it's different, different goals here, but uh, all means to an end that are, I think, noble in both cases. And there are, are very strong feelings in both camps. Uh, then on the location and frequency continuum, some groups are just, they like pool all their resources and are just going to do a one-off event. Um, maybe, maybe it's annually, um, but there's sort of no guarantee. So that it can be sort of like a one and done, just try it out, um, raising awareness event. Sometimes these happen as parts of like a, a sustainability festival or something. On the other end, and I think we're going to hear from La Bom in more in this vein, that it's part of their like regular operations. So it's it is really everywhere along that continuum. A lot of the groups are aiming for at least a few times a year. I think I've seen most most of them do like maybe quarterly events. Some are doing weekly events, but they're very small scale typically. Um, the, the larger, larger scale, less frequent events, uh, I think there's sort of like a built up demand. So people, there's a, a lot more promotional effort there and people like keep their things for sometimes months to go to this one event. So it's the weekly events, they are smaller, they are not promoted so much um and there's just it's sort of a slower more casual pace the less frequent events it's it's more of an event a production really and i think they all work um i don't i don't love the pop-up event because it can be the most stressful and labor intensive uh, typically, these events are at a host location where you can't, there's no possibility to store supplies and sometimes even to bring supplies in prior to the event. Uh, so you have to load everything in day of, set up a room, get get all, it's, it's a very labor intensive push. Whereas the embedded, uh, more frequent events that are just part of a tool library space or um, let's see who else has more regular ones. Let's just say tool libraries in this case or libraries. They already have the space set up. Maybe some chairs need to be rearranged, but they have the supplies there. You just sort of get some things out and it's, it's a very, it's much lower lift. Then who was who was organizing these events? Um, the group that I got involved with, uh, Repair Cafe Pasadena, several years ago, they have they were always and continue to be all volunteer run. Um, and then one of the groups that I've been, I don't work directly with them, but they're sort of in our ecosystem here in Washington State is King County, and the King County runs repair events. Uh, everywhere outside of the Seattle area. So it is embedded part of their government programming and as such, they have um, county staff that are tied to specifically running that program. They both have benefits and then in the middle, it's, uh, more like nonprofits, um, some other smaller community institutions running it. So sometimes there are paid staff focusing on the program sometimes not so much, um, but they all have benefits and they all have challenges. With the all volunteers, obviously it's all volunteers. So there can be a lot of turnover and you, you lose some of the institutional knowledge gained, um, especially when uh, somebody in a more leadership role leaves. So it can, it can be a challenge to get somebody else 
to commit to that role and get up to speed, but they tend to be very agile and they don't have to wait on um, lots of bureaucratic permissions or for grants to come through. They can host them as often as they feel like rallying around um, or as infrequently, there, there's sort of no expectations, um, but they, as you see under the limitations, they're often, they don't have fiscal sponsorship. So they have a, a reduced capacity to take donations or seek funding. And of course there are some uh, administrative challenges that can come along with that. Like who's, who's going to field requests, who's going to get the um, mailing account where we send newsletters from, et cetera. Um, the organization based, which is is more where I I did significant work recently um, through Zero Waste Washington. It's it has more support. There are some organizational resources to tap into, but uh, kind of like with that program, it became dependent on specific funding that allowed uh, those to exist. So once if if funding is not consistent, then programs can very easily go away. Uh, the government backed programs, I'm working with a few groups right now who are trying to get their, their counties or their cities on board. And it can be, a, once they do, it can be a huge benefit, but that process can be very long. Um, and, uh, one, one group is struggling particularly with concerns about liability right now. Uh, because they, it's, this is nothing like they've ever done. So they're like, oh, but all, all of the like question marks that we're now introducing and the, we're government and we're not, we're not comfortable with that. So there can be wins and hurdles for each one. Data collection. Uh, this is one of my favorite enduring topics. And again, it is all across the board um one of the fixer there's a finney fixer collective that um is in seattle they just show up and people just show up nothing nothing is documented anywhere um so it, it results in a very casual setting friendly chats and it's and then it, it uh wraps up then with more typically the like organization based groups, uh, there's some impetus to collect a little bit more. How many people attended? Uh, take some pictures so you can share that with your constituency. Um, sometimes if it's a grant based program, then there's a little bit more need for a, you know, we need to know a bit what's what happened during the event. So a little bit additional data. And finally, all the data. We need all the data. There are some advantages to this, but it is um, it is intensive. So particularly with grant funding, particularly with government-based programs, there to cover liability, you just you need to get all of your your waivers, your contact information back like things to things to keep you safe and to keep the guests safe. So a lot of concern around liability, um, getting insurance coverage for the event space if you're if you're at a, a community center. Um, and additionally, because you're looking more into like what populations are we serving, there's uh, more push to collect demographic data, travel, how far were people willing to travel to do this? Or I think a little more insidiously, were people traveling from outside the, the service area? Not great, but some of the things that can be collected at these events that feed higher goals, which I'll try to touch on later, um, are what things were brought in, where were there certain models um, that were fixable, that were not fixable, um, how much weight is being saved from the landfill, how uh, how many greenhouse gases are being theoretically offset 
by this item being kept in service for longer. And in some cases, those, those pieces of information are just being fed to the funder, um, which is fine. And it, it serves like solid waste, um, county, city, state needs. But for even higher purpose, uh, when it's reported through things like the Open Repair Alliance or the Repair Monitor, which Repair Monitor it comes out of Repair Cafe International, Open Repair Alliance is part of the Restart Project and some of the other uh, non-repair cafe uh, entities. It's, it's actually filtering up and becoming a data set that anyone around the world can access to see, oh, this kind of coffee maker is really just not repairable. Um, can we, groups like iFixit, uh, repair.org, they're able to go to manufacturers increasingly, and, and also in the US, US PERG, go to the manufacturers to push for changes in design. So maybe at some point things will become more repairable, but it, it's a little bit um, trying to introduce accountability into consumer goods development. So it's very burdensome to collect this amount of data, but it can be useful. And then some of the locations besides tool libraries that I've seen groups doing uh, repair events at, it's all over the map, um, popping up in parking lots, obviously maker spaces are a good fit, breweries, food banks, block parties, um, a, one, one great option is partnering with a local hardware store because if a certain part is needed for an item, it's very easy for the guest to just go quickly grab the item, bring it back and get it fixed because as we know so many times, it's a broken part that you just don't happen to have with you. Uh, and even though we, in many cases, uh, repair groups ask for guests to bring the replacement part with them. People often don't know what the replacement part is, or even when to if it's a if it's a part that's the problem. Sometimes it's it's not a part. Sometimes it's things that are glued together, and they don't even know how to get into the guts. So that said, co-locating or partnering with a hardware store is a great option, but any of these locations work pretty well for the level of effort and community that you're trying to serve. And I guess that is, that's sort of the through line for all of, all of these organizing um, groups is what makes most sense for you as organizers, how much energy do you have to devote to it? How, how many resources do you have to rely on? What is the community that you're working with need? Maybe it's not appropriate to try to do it every week because it's that's just not needed. Or location-wise, it's not gonna work for it to be at a single location all the time. Maybe it's better to move it around the, the community to make it a little more accessible. Um, I, I tend to be more in the camp of making it a little more consistent and a consistent location so that people can plan better um, rather than just like trying to move it geographically a lot because introducing inconsistency in timing and location means that it, it feels a little less reliable. People can't plan for it as easily, even if it's not so conveniently located to you. If you know where it's going to be, always, then you can maybe make arrangements to get there. Um, yeah. Uh, I did, I can touch on the um, right to repair, Tom, maybe a little bit later, but in the meantime, if you all have questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, I oversee the Repair Economy Washington site and all of the groups here and run the Repair Economy Annual Summit and co-host the Shop Talks, which are just uh, monthly gatherings for people to well, talk shop 
about what's working, what's not, and ideas that they want to chat about. So that's me. Oh, hello, hello. Should I just jump in it? Okay. Yes, you're good to just jump in. Okay, uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, wait a second. Um, all right, can you see it? Yeah. Um, okay, hello everyone. I'm Tatiana. I, uh, I come from France. Uh, so bear in mind, it's, English is not my first language. It's not even my second language. So <laughs> just be patient with me. Um, I'm happy that Tom... Uh, asked us to present our Repair Cafe. Um, we had a chance to have Tom over twice, actually, uh, in, in our association, in our nonprofit building. And um, and so I'm really happy to, to, to be able to talk to people that are not in our on our con continent and in our country. So um, I think, like, the story of our Repair Cafe is how... I'm sorry, can... Tatiana. Can you give oh. me just one second? I just wanted to yeah, check sure. in um to make sure we didn't have if see if anyone had questions for sure, sure. uh Cami. Sure, sure. Okay. Um and if you do just drop them in the chat and we'll get we'll get to them later. Thank you. Go ahead, Tatiana. Thank you. Um yeah, so Kami. Is that, is that how I pronounce it? Kami, is that right? Okay, so Kami, I was really inspired actually by your uh, presentation. So I, I kind of like put it in my presentation and, and, and kind of, I don't know, I, I hope it's clever. So basically we are, an, uh, we are a nonprofit based in, uh, uh, in the outskirts of Paris, right next to Paris. Actually, we have the metro. Uh, and uh, we are a library of things, but we're also many other things. Uh, and one of one of the things we do is uh, we hold a repair cafe twice a week, so that's like uh, ten hours of repairing um, uh, in our building. And we also have repair events uh, in the city and in Paris, and that's like three or four times a month. So now we have like partnerships with uh, hosts that will welcome us to have those repair cafes because we're really identified as um, as fixers in our community, I guess. Um, so we opened in April 2022, just as a little bit of background, where we have uh, three full-time employees. And I, I, I feel like uh, from having checked the... Uh, Tom's work around uh, libraries of things. I feel like we are a library of things that has a lot of employees actually, because a lot of uh, libraries that actually uh, volunteer run. Uh, and uh, we have three full-time employees, but we also have like around 30 volunteers. Um, we have uh, 1,400 members, uh, 800 items, and we hold 20 workshops kind of like around 20 workshops per month. So we have those repair cafes, but we also have workshops on sewing, woodwork, um, anything that has anything to do with reusing. So it can also be around uh, um, activities for children, um, we'll use uh, waste and try to build something new from it. And that's that's what we do. And um, and yeah, so that's that's a little bit of a story. Uh, we fixed last year. We like to say that we fixed one uh, item per day, um, which was not exactly how it was, but we we fixed a lot of items. Um, uh, for us, it's not exactly a goal. For us, as you said, Kami, uh, the goal is not to have a hundred percent success rate in uh, in our 
um, in repairing, but it's still, I feel like we have a very hands-on approach to repairing. So we are, uh, we are close to the repair cafe philosophy, but we are also, we, we're aware that we have one uh, fixer who's an employee, which makes it a bit less, um, um, a bit less, uh, maybe a bit more kind of professional, even though he's not a professional of fixing. So he, he's not a repairman. He just learns how to repair uh, from his experience. And uh, so he prides himself that he has a seventy percent success rate, which is true actually. Like a lot of our, uh, a lot of our items are repaired um, very often, um, and sometimes it can be a bit at the cost of the learning process or at the empowerment. You know, we're not exactly on the empowerment spectrum, which is why we hold workshops that are kind of uh, more uh, about empowering. Uh, for example, we have uh, workshops on uh, DIY or home repair uh, for women uh, and uh, gender minorities, and that's why we that it's kind of a space we we try to have spaces where it's more about learning and or repair cafe is kind of about learning, but it's also a lot about actually repairing, uh, which I think makes it uh, interesting because. Um, when we started the Repair Cafe, um, we were not exactly aware of what was the need. If, if there was a need for a Repair Cafe in the neighborhood, we just tried it. And um, quickly, we, we saw that people were coming in, uh, and usually there were people, not the same people that come to the Library of Things, you know. So uh, usually there are people who have... Um, who come here for uh, who come to repair for more of economic motives, and um, and so it was interesting for us that they really needed kind of needed to have a, an object repaired because uh, that would that would mean not having to buy an object uh, an item, and um, not everyone is in that kind of philosophy, but it was still there was still a need for that, and. Um, we started like to open more slots because we we work on uh, on actual slots, so it's Wednesdays and Saturdays, and it's half an hour for each repair. Um, and so, uh, and so we started out uh, like this, and then we uh started to have a real volunteer community around uh our our full time paid worker, and um, and then um. Uh, yeah, that's how, that's how uh, we work now. So we work twice a week, uh, and uh, and we have a, a pretty decent success rate. Um, I wanted to touch on uh, how much does it cost to actually have um, and uh, two twice a week to have a, a repair cafe. I feel like probably our models uh, are very different in the U.S. and in France. We have a lot of government grants here, but very little um, uh, help from companies, foundations. We, we don't actually have any help from the private sector. We really work with the public sector. And um, and so they help us a lot. And, and it it's represents actually maybe 75% of our budget uh, for the Repair Cafe. And overall, for the whole nonprofit, it represents around 65%. And then we try to have an economic model that works for us. So we we also started um, we started selling a service to uh, housing service companies. I don't know if you have that in the U.S., but basically in France, there are companies that run um, public housing. And uh, they usually need to, uh, uh, they now have kind of environmental standards and uh, standards on waste management and especially around the behaviors of people that live in those, uh, in those uh, buildings. And so it's kind of a way to uh, make them part of the, of the solution. And then you, you just, we hold workshops um, um, where the building is, 
and then people just come downstairs and they bring their stuff and we help them repair and then they know about our work at uh, La Bum and they will they tend to come more often to see us and have the the point is having the reflex to repair uh, those objects rather than throwing it away and sometimes throwing it away in the on the streets and uh, and so that's that's the whole thing we we try to we, we sell those uh, services and it brings us actually twenty percent of our budget which is quite interesting for us and then there's some of the budget I'd say around five to ten percent that is just memberships and donations. And a membership is, I think it's very low compared to a lot of the libraries of things, even in France. Uh, we we have a 24 euro per year, which is I think around $3. Um, and then people can just borrow anything. And uh, we have a free donation policy with the Repair Cafe and all of our workshops. So we try to encourage people to have, be conscious of the work that is, um, that we take. Um, and um, and so we encourage those free donations. Um, still, I feel like it's not it's probably not a very sustainable way uh, to to have that model, but for us, it works because they're in France and Europe in general, there's a whole uh, there are policies uh, around repairing. I think Tom talked about with Jamie earlier about those policies that you to have in some of the U.S. states, and um, um, and so they're encouraging repairing. Uh, what we have in France is that they will give uh, for uh, standard repairing that we'll have in uh, uh, with big companies. They will offer people to have a, a um, how would I say that? Like they they will pay for some of the uh, repair. Uh, and so instead of paying like 80 euros to or 100 euros to repair your uh, washing machine, then you'd pay only like 50 euros. And uh, it's a whole thing, but we are out of it because we can't like have, um, uh, it will mean for us to, to really apply those standards, those company standards. So making a quote, uh, having a, a fixer that is uh, that has a diploma, uh, so um, a repair diploma, like an official diploma with that, and then you have to make a quote, and then you have to have a lot of data also. Um, and it's all, it, it's all too heavy for us as a um, as an organization. So we we just kind of try to make it an argument to still like get government grants uh, because we do a lot of work, we do a lot of repair work, and we are way cheaper. <laughs> than uh, those companies that do repair. And um, and yeah, so we try to benefit from it and to, uh, yeah, to benefit from it. Uh, I'm, I wanted to show you a little bit of um, our software. I hope I'll manage it. Um, it's not really a software. It's more like, just so you can see like about the data and all the information. It's in French, but I'll, I'll explain it to you. Um, so basically, if you can see my screen, um, this is what it looks like for us um, to um, uh, to look for a slot and to uh, and to reserve a slot for the people to book a slot for the people who come to La Bum and ask to repair something. Usually, people come with their object and they're like, "I want to repair this item. Can I can I come in and can I do it?" And we usually have to tell them, "Okay." <laughs> We're gonna have to wait a little bit. As you see, this is like uh, tomorrow um, and Saturday. And actually this is not very busy because it's that time of the year where it's starting to be less less busy. Uh, we're gonna be closed from the 24th of July till the 10th. But as you can see, I feel like it's a good model. Um, even though like I feel uh, in the repair cafe philosophy, I know it's like we don't have slots and it's, that's how it is. But for our uh, fixers, it was really kind of a security to have this so they can uh, kind of control the amount of people that come in. Because uh, usually you'd have all of this in red, you know, the whole week, the whole next two weeks, actually. 
And then what we have is a history of what we did, which I think is also super interesting. So, uh, so you'd have the name, I mean, don't mind it, you'd have the name of the people that come in and then you'd have the object that they wanted to repair and then the status of uh, the reparation. Um, is it fixed? Uh, here you, you, you can see that someone didn't show up, which happens also. Um, and so it's kind of the data we do have, which can allow us to say, oh, we had 70% uh, yeah, reparations done. Um, even though sometimes they forget to fill it. Um, and that's how it is. That's, I think it's a really good, um, it's a really good um, tool for us to really follow what's happening. Um, and then we can also like from this extract uh, some information to see if the, the people that come in to repair things are also the people that will, uh, that will borrow, which for us is very important to have some kind of um, cohesion, to have some, yeah, to have a system where people will come to the workshops and will borrow things and will repair things, and it's and so it's a whole um, integrated service. It's very important for us. Um, all right, and then um, so. I just wanted to like stay humble. I feel like we still have a lot to learn, even though we have a it's a major success for us, uh, the Repair Cafe because um, it's become as big as important a service to the community as to lending, uh, definitely because we have uh, a lot of people that are coming in for this, a lot of people that are coming in through this, and then uh, getting to know the rest of the things we do and then we also have that intuition that we are trying to um to uh to to see if it's actually true uh, through a sociology study that we're doing um to see who are the people that come in and repair things who are the people that come in and and borrow things and who are the people that come in and, and go to workshops but our intuition is that we have the capacity and do uh, touch people that are maybe less, um, um, how would I say that, that maybe have less money and that are less, um, um, uh, that are less into like the ecology and all of that, you know, that's thinking. And, and it's good because it's a way to really make them uh, make them uh, contribute to that. And so to stay humble, we still have a lot of things to go through. We need to uh, build on the data a little more. We definitely need to uh, be more about the learning process. As I said, I feel like maybe we're missing something through having very hands-on with fixers. And, um, and um, I would say um, we need a, a lot of people say that we do need a little bit more sessions that it's not enough uh, which <laughs> makes me really wonder how how many days we would we should have to repair but it's the same problem we do have with the uh, with the lending um, and library of things because it's um uh, we're, we're open only two and a half days a week so it's still it's a struggle you know I feel like everyone has that struggle when you volunteer around and even if you're not volunteer and it's still a struggle. So, you know, uh, so we are we're trying to make it better and I hope uh, we will. And that's it. Awesome. Yeah, maybe for the sake of time, I can just jump in and then do questions at the end, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, that sounds good. All right. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Jessa Wace, and I'm a co-director at the Station North Tool Library. Um, and I'm going to talk about both the fix-it fairs that we run, as well as a free toolkit that you all can use that maybe can help inform you creating your own repair events. Um, so yeah, I wanted to start 
with just some of the flyers throughout the years because our branding around Fix It Fair continues to change. We're always highlighting, um, especially in the more recent iterations, that it's a free event. You don't want to hide that fact. Um, but I wanted to kind of put our events on Cami's continuum because I thought that was a, a cool way of thinking of it. Um, so we do lean more towards the uh, pop-up side. I know that um, my co-director Liana has presented a few times. So I think you all are familiar with the Station North Tool Library. Um, but we are a tool lending library. We're a nonprofit. We have four full-time staff, 80 plus volunteers. Um, and we do, we run 30 plus classes. So we do a lot. Fix-it fairs are the things um, historically, it's been around two times a year. So we definitely fall more on the pop-up side of things in terms of frequency. Um, we are really excited about building more capacity to have more. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, what a fix-it fair with the tool library looks like. But yeah, for now, it's twice a year. Um, it's all sorts of repairs. So it's you know appliances, bikes, clothing repair. Um, like Cami mentioned, it's a ton of labor to run one of these because we need to cover all of these different areas of fixing. Um, but we've especially been excited about adding more repair clinics. So maybe just doing mending one day or just doing bike repair, because that would be a lot easier capacity wise. Um, in terms of the philosophical continuum, we definitely fall in the blended sphere here. Um, so you work with your fixer. Um, we do it kind of within reason. So if there's something like um, taking something apart will help match, like here's the right screwdriver driver for the for the job. Um, would you like to learn how to take this apart? Um, but at the end of the day, if the person's um, not super comfortable doing the fix, we will uh, do the fix for them, but we'll also, we'll never be, um, you know, fixing it for them and having them drop their item and leave. We wanna make it an uh, instructional, um, moment so folks are at least at a bare minimum they're the fixers explaining what they're doing um with the participant but definitely fall in blended um i can't see the chat also so if people do say stuff feel free i don't mind um if folks yeah interrupt me with other questions um i did want to talk a bit because this was a huge success for us um almost every fix it fair we've run uh has been on site at the tool library. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the pros and cons of that, um, but our most recent one was April in are. April. Um, someone's audio is on. Um, all right. Um, so yeah, our most recent one in April, we partnered with our local public library system. Um, this was our first fully funded fix it fair. So instead of um, our organization kind of footing the bill for this free event, the, our public library system gave us $5,000 and there was a lot of trust there. They didn't need to see, you know, um, the details of how we spent that money. They just said, here's $5,000, like make it happen, which was perfect for us. Um, historically, our events have been fully volunteered powered other than our full-time staff doing some of the back end work. Um, typically, so like for this most recent one, there was one full-time staff member, myself, and then we had a planning committee of with four other volunteers and met weekly to make sure the event was a success. Um, Fix-it fairs are always free. Like Tatiana mentioned, um, we definitely will take donations and tend to bring in um, a little bit of money from folks who are excited about the event and had a good time. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about volunteer recruitment as well. So yeah, quickly, um, on-site versus off-site. Um, it's, it's kind of obvious, but when you do it at a tool library, all of the tools are here. So we do some work to set up the zones, but at the end of the day, we're, we're running into the library to like grab that specific item. Um, we have just home turf advantage. We know the space. Um, we have like a lot of control. Um, I always love the way that Fix It Fair on site promotes classes and membership and open shop because you get to really show someone like here is the space, here's what the lending library looks like. Now you have some more knowledge about tools and you can borrow the tools you use today from the library. So there's a lot of perks on about um, in terms of having a Fix It Fair on site. Um, Though we had a lot of fun having it offsite. It was a ton, a ton of work, but we really have been focused on building kits that um, actually live in the library 
and are sectioned off by type. So we have mending, we have tinkering. Um, and because we got funding for the last Fix It Fair, we were able to buy separate tools and consumables that are designated for Fix It Fair. And that's gonna go a really long way in expanding our capacity because we don't have to pull all the drills from the library. We don't have to pull the Fix It Kit from the library. Um, we get to really have like designated uh, tools and consumables. Um, so we feel much more prepared to do it offsite. Um, we all knew that it would help us reach new people, but I was like pleasantly surprised by the number of new people we reached. It was really at a central place in the city. So many folks who had never heard of the tool library were excited. We had folks like running home to grab broken items and running back to like make it in time for the event, which we definitely love to see. Um, it was a chance to just have valuable partnership development. Um, but yeah, definitely you want to be intentional about the needs of the event. We were lucky it was at a public library, but they told us you can be noisy, you can make a mess. Um, it was in the central hall. So it was just anyone coming into the library learned about the tool library and the event. I just quickly wanted to touch on on-site versus off-site. Um, and then another thing, just thinking about being an organization that relies on volunteers, we have done a lot to build this volunteer base of handy fixers. Um, the skills that we're looking for in a fix it fair volunteer are the same skills we're looking for for internal volunteers. So our fixers, uh, the majority of them will come in and help us fix broken tools at the library. Um, in addition to this like specific event. So yeah, while it's a lot of work to run these events, we definitely view it as an important volunteer recruitment um, method as well. So are the one, this is um, an image from the last one we had. So we're in that central hall, I mentioned that lobby area. Um, and we had over 47 volunteers make this event a reality. Um, almost everyone, I would say maybe 35 or 30 folks um, are more regular volunteers. And then maybe 15 folks only come for Fix It Fair. Though a lot of folks were also emailing us like, I wanna help fix tools as well. Um, so yeah, it goes a long way. Little things like making sure everyone got to take home a tool library t-shirt. We felt very professional, very legit. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, this with the, the toolkit. But just a reminder, the volunteer sign up form is a great place to gain insights on folks experience. I always love when you meet someone who's like, I'm a general fixer, I can do uh, jewelry, I can do electronics, I can do this. I make like a special star next to them because I know we were talking about managing the line. Having floating fixers has also been really helpful so we can meet the demand that's there um, on site. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna um, go through these next slides pretty quickly. Um, we have been doing better with data collection. One thing I really um, appreciate is our attention to detail with checkout. So any time um, we see someone, we, it's really important they check out so we can have accurate data on how successful we are. And then whenever an item was fixed, we weigh the item so we can get a sense at um, the potential carbon emissions that we diverted. Um, so this is kind of a, a quick view of that. And then every time we do a fix it fair, we release graphics that look something like this. So our last one, we had over 130 people participate, over 150 items, similar statistics that have been mentioned um which we're we're super happy with and then we also like to do a little breakdown um by uh category i will mention um another perk of having it on site is we could do knife sharpening um so we take dull knives and sharpen them that's an area we have really high success rate um so our numbers were also a little bit lower due to that but since it was at a public library there were no weapons no knives and, and things like that so that's another consideration um, but without further ado, I want to um, quickly show you the toolkit. Um, is this is this a good view for y'all? It's kind of hard to tell. I will assume it's a good view. Um, so yeah, this was a toolkit created by Emily Shrope and our team here at the Tool Library. Um, Emily was doing like a capstone project in her graduate at her graduate school. Um, and it really goes through, you know, what is a fix it fair? What is the right to repair movement? 
how do you plan a successful event, volunteer recruitment, day of details, post event with some examples. So this is an image of what it looked like uh, when we had the Fix It Fair on site. Um, you can see a little glimpse at that queue system that um, I'm happy to talk about uh, once we hit um, our time for today. But just to quickly show you, this is on our website. It's linked in the slides. Um, we put a decent amount of work into this and it goes through the different roles of the planning committee. Um, it goes through a calendar, how long it takes to run an event like this. Um, again, just for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of quickly go through this and I'm happy to answer questions and um, dig deeper into anything. I have a few minutes after this to, um, to stay on. Um, marketing, this, I have a more robust list of materials and tools, so I'm happy to show that out, but this is an example of what some of the materials uh, checklist can look like. A learning for us has been definitely sending out the tools and consumables to all of our volunteers beforehand so they can kind of know what to expect. And then it also worked really well to have fixers bring their own tools if they have them. It just makes things run a lot smoother. This is an example of like one of the floor plans. We definitely like to group things like items. Um, a bit more about volunteer recruitment. Um, again, for the sake of time, I'm going through this super fast, but um, given the interest in the chat, I do wanna highlight, I think having our floating volunteers, that's something, that's the role I typically play because I know almost all of the fixers, I know their expertise. Um, being able to spend time hosting, checking in on people, moving the queue through, um, I think has really helped in terms of uh, keeping a line from forming. And then we have the fixer roles, et cetera. Um, for the sake of time, I am gonna stop. Well, I guess I'll just quickly, sorry. I'm gonna stop with the toolkit and just finish off. Um, because I don't see enough people doing this, the photo booth, y'all. I feel like the photo booth is uh, a really awesome way to celebrate the event. Um, it really encourages checkout. We say you have to check out and give us you know, the data, but the photo booth is totally optional. Um, but I love the visuals of like fixed it, fix it fair. We're trying to get folks using that on social media and stuff as well. So just a couple quick photos from the photo booth. And then another thing we wanna do better is the swag. Um, these stickers one of our volunteers made, um, but these were super, super popular. I think they go a long way in getting conversations started. Um, so highly recommend having free stickers and other swag for your event um, as well. So yeah, I will stop with, um, just for the sake of time there. Um, but yeah, that's, again, that's, that's what we do over at the Tool Library. We are excited about having more repair events. Um, but for now have leaned more into these like super big, um, bring any item, we'll do our best category. And like it's been mentioned, has been mentioned, the most common thing we hear all the time is, um, when's the next one? When's the next one? I have something broken, help me fix it. So we know that there's a demand out there for, for these types of things. Woo, that was a lot from start That's a to lot. finish from all yeah. three of y'all. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I love the photo booth. It's and just the the images of that getting to share that all around. I think that's an awesome addition. So good on you for that one. And the toolkit is is very clear and clearly have have uh, brought in a lot of that institutional knowledge uh, to be able to share it through that. So um, I just posted that in the chat for anybody who missed it. If you want to check out the the um, fix it fair toolkit um, questions. And I know there's been a, a lot of questions and answers going back and forth in the chat, um, but any other questions uh, for, for Jessa, uh, Tatiana, who's still here, maybe in the background, icing uh, an extracted tooth and, and Cammie. <laughs> Oh, and uh, Tom, to your question earlier about right to repair laws, I'm going to put oh. something in the chat. Oh, that's not now not the right. Hold on, let me go find it. I was going to put um, the link. Well, I can just do repair.org has a great 
uh, up-to-date iteration of like where all the repair laws are passed in the U.S. only, sorry, um, mm -hmm. and how they will affect what is happening in your state. And they are advocating along with U.S. PERG and um, iFixit for more producer responsibility and possibly uh, a repairability index like France already has. Mm -hmm. right, we're at the we're at the hour. So if we're oh maybe a question just come through. Uh oh yeah the sticky notes. Do you want to just yeah let let's let's do maybe a quick little round robin about how to manage uh, people because there was definitely a lot of of chat in there and it would be great to kind of capture some of that on video. Yeah, I I can just quickly say obviously supply and demand having a lot of fixers on site clearly will decrease the wait time. Um, we've done better at training our fixer volunteers. A lot of them are really stubborn and hardworking and awesome but we have to say like at a certain point you have to it's not a good fit for the event um so we say if you're not making progress in 30 minutes um that might be a time to to move on but no longer than an hour on any one fix is, is our rule of thumb um so yeah that's important because if you have one fixer fixing something for hours then that, it's gonna create more of a line um and then I think just the transparency of knowing where you are in the queue is helpful. Um, the first Fix It Fair I helped organize, um, we didn't have this transparent system. So there was just like, this confusion of like, wait, I was here first, like, but this person's getting seen before me. And that's not the vibe we want. So each um, area has its own whiteboard queue at the, for the tool library. Um, and you get when a fixer comes in, um, cause we have two shifts for fixers as well. Their name gets added to the whiteboard. They get matched with um, the participant. And it's also really nice because they immediately know one another's names. Um, we write what the item is. So if I, we can't find someone, a floater will be like, I'm looking for someone with the broken toaster. And I would like go and find them and make sure, you know, it's their time in the line. Um, and then fixers can actually manage their own queue. So once every fixer has a sticky note attached, there's a, a, a line order um, in the queue, one, two, three, four. So once you put it in the dumb pile, you pick from the queue. And it like, again, I think the transparency helps with waiting. Um, and we also will engage folks while they're waiting and talk about the library and things like that. So that's kind of uh, the long and the short, but page 25 also goes into it um, in the toolkit we shared. Uh, and on the sticky note topic, I, I'd shared that when I was still doing fix it fairs, we had moved to blue tape. You might consider a lighter colored tape because we found that the blue tape was sometimes too dark to read the Sharpie on, but um, we indicated the, the letter of the fix category. So E for electronics, let's say, and then the number of the item as it came in. So the item got tagged. Oh, that was loud. Um, tagged with that um, number, and then the person got the corresponding number to keep with them. So all the items were filtered to the appropriate fix station. And then this this is where it allowed some flexibility because uh, as I, I think it was Laura who mentioned, it's not always what is next, which is doable. Um, so since we have typically, you know, let's say five, to 10 electronics or mechanical fixers, um, some who have more advanced skills than others, things didn't always flow just as first, first come, first serve in the line. So it gave you a little bit of flexibility of like, oh, now this item that seems to be a little bit simpler can be pulled and then the guest uh, guest finder would go find that person. And it, it just, it softened the, the feeling on the guest's end. But having additional activities is real useful. And the sticky notes, uh, we found that like just sticky notes, they were like fly all over the place and get lost because they weren't sticky enough. So the tape was a, a real win for us. I've also seen like paper tags safety pinned. That doesn't, that doesn't work in a lot of cases. 
Mm, silver Sharpies. Yeah, true. They're more expensive though, aren't they? Yep. And extra those, those sticky, sticky probably. notes. I love that. <laughs> Any, any other questions or, or just, uh, advice when for hosting, a, a fix it fair or a repair cafe, uh, anything that hasn't been mentioned already, somebody listening in, I guess, since it was only in the chat, maybe we mm -hmm. could, um, talk a little bit about the ratios of attendees to fixers. Mm -hmm. Um, anybody? Well, for, for us, I think our experience is that we, since we have it twice a week, um, we're kind of careful to not have a fixing burnout, you know, so, from our our fixers. So, uh, we usually have so you have eight slots per day, and we have at least two fixers, or a paid employee and one volunteer who loves to volunteer who is always here. And then, and all the other volunteers kind of do extras or like people who were not, didn't book a slot. So we just kind of have them over anyway, and they will go with the, the other volunteers or things that we struggle to repair. You know, they will spend some time uh, uh, with people to, to, uh, to try and repair it. And sometimes without people, I know Jeff has said that, <laughs> that, <laughs> Definitely, we try to to include people in the process, but we do have stuff like if I could show you like our our, our space is filled with with uh, with stuff all around with items, and so we kind of do repair um outside the slots too, you know, and try to to give it back to people if we can. So yeah, I would say definitely for eight people, I'd say you need two fixes, you know. I think the ratio, adjusted ratio, it was one. If you take 130 attendees for 35 fixes, I think it's about the same. It's like three, three and a half people, three and a half attendees per per fixer. That's what we do too. Oh, yeah, that's a good point, Amanda. Um, some people will interpret items collectively. So an entire set of kitchen knives is not one item. Um, and that will that can become challenging in messaging. You're going to get them anyway, but uh, you're going to have to manage expectations uh, on intake. I actually have a question for you because I see like a lot of um, um we are mostly fixing electronic, electric stuff. Um, we also have a space dedicated to sewing, which is uh we, we which we do like but uh less often. It's once a week. Um, about sharpening. Um, I feel there's you have to have a special skill right to sharpen some. Tools. So, how do you do it? Do you have people that have that that skill, or do you learn it? Yeah. So, we at the tool library we have a knife shop. So, we actually teach folks knife making. One of our teachers also teaches a hand sharpening class. Um, I will say we don't do serrated knives, so we tend to do more like chef's knives, um, and then we do tool sharpening, so like axe sharpening. Um, you know, and things like that. Um, and then we have grinders and hand stones and things like that. So it's mostly our knife making teachers and we have monitors as well who have a lot of sharpening experience. Um, those are the folks that will do knife sharpening. Yeah, so they come to us already knowing how to sharpen. And then I'm also adding in the chat, um, we did more marketing around what items to bring, what items not to bring. And in case it's helpful, um, this is how we, like one of the constraints we put on it was size. We were like, big items, you need help carrying. Like, please, we've had people try to bring big couches. It's just not a good fit for the event. It literally takes up too much space. Gas powered items, knives at this one, this was for the, um, the one at the library. Um, 
weapons, smartphones, computers, which we actually do some fixing around that, but it's, it, it's kind of a, a tricky area. And then we also did more on promoting what to bring um, because we had for the first time someone doing um, that was, we, we I didn't use weapons language um, before Tatiana, but we have had Nerf guns, which we did fix. Um, but it's something luckily that hasn't been a huge issue. We did have someone DM us if they could bring um, a vibrator at the last yes, event. <laughs> and um, yeah, we, we did say no on that one. Um, did you, Cammy? what did you say when you got that request? Um, I think we ultimately <laughs> said yes, but they didn't show up. Just like and some of it you, again it's is on you to be sure that the item that you bring is clean. Yeah. And, and then also we have and people wearing gloves and have sanitizing. Oh, stuff. yeah. Anyway, That's the person didn't funny. show up. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but we, you know, we still said it, and then. It also was cool for the first time we had um, a volunteer speci specifically doing leather care mm -hmm. and we had um, book mending, which pros and cons of that one. It took, they did two repairs and it took them forever, but it was kind of, you know, it was cool. They, they had fun. Um, so yeah, that pre uh, messaging is um, really helpful for folks to help them understand what to expect. Um, and then the registration I mentioned can be helpful with telling folks like this isn't a good fit for the event. Oh, if you know that this is broken, we recommend bringing your own replacement part. We only have so many items. Um, so yeah, that pre-event communication goes a long way in managing expectations. Um, yeah, I also, see Amanda also, said nothing. Uh, uh, yep, microwave, microwaves are uh, often a no-go. There are some fixers who do feel comfortable with it, but it's uh, it can get... Mm pretty lethal if yeah if you're not careful so a lot of groups will just say no microwaves <laughs> for those watching the video we're all just chuckling about the chat um <laughs> all right i feel like we are now at quarter after um, unless there's anything pressing, I do want to wrap this up and let those of you that are still on, we didn't get a chance to say, but we will be, again, this is the first of, uh, six monthly sessions for the rest of the year. So we'll be sending out, in, um, information about the next one within about the next week or so. And all these recordings will continue to be put up on canvas as we've been doing with all the, the previous library of things recordings. So we'll get those out within the next week. Well, thank you all for, for sharing and thanks for staying up so late, Tatiana. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm kind of tired. I'm sorry if I didn't make too much sense. But, um, <laughs> but I'd be happy if, if any of you want to talk about it again. And thank you very much. It's a great initiative uh, to Sharable and Tom. Thank you.